In the previous video, we learnt about various collections of the grey matter within the midbrain. So now let us proceed to the white matter in the midbrain and learn about some of the pathways here. First, let us begin with the crust cerebri. Crust cerebri form the anterior most parts of the cerebral peduncles. They represent the basal part of the brainstem. So they contain all the descending fibers coming from the cerebral cortex. So the fibers which start from the cerebral cortex will first descend through the corona radiator, then through the internal capsule and when they reach midbrain, they collect together to form the crust cerebri. Within each crust cerebri, the middle two-thirds is occupied by the corticospinal and corticonuclear fibers. The arrangement is such that the corticonuclear fibers are more medial and corticospinal fibers are more lateral. So we have the head and the cervical region represented medially and the sacral fibers located laterally. Medial one-sixth of the crust cerebri is occupied by the frontopontine fibers and lateral sixth is occupied by the paritopontine, temporopontine and the occipitopontine fibers. Now these two sets of fibers belong to corticopontocerebellar pathway. All these fibers in the crust cerebri will descend to the basilar pons where the fibers of the corticopontocerebellar pathway will relay in the pontine nuclei. The corticospinal fibers will descend through the basilar pons to reach the medulla so as to form the pyramids. Corticonuclear fibers, some of them will relay in the nuclei within midbrain. Some other fibers will relay in the nuclei within pons and the remaining fibers will descend to medulla where they relay in the nuclei within medulla. Now coming to the tegmental region of the midbrain, we find the band of lemnisci here. At the level of inferior colliculi, we find all the four lemnisci, that is medial lemniscus, trigeminal, spinal and lateral lemnisci. The same four which were found in pons also, but in pons these lemnisci were arranged mediolaterally. Here the arrangement is more ventrodorsal. But when we take a section at the level of superior colliculi, we only find medial, trigeminal and spinal lemnisci. Lateral lemniscus is not found at this level because the fibers in the lateral lemniscus would have terminated by relaying in the inferior colliculus at the lower level. All these lemnisci we have learnt in detail in some of our earlier videos. So those of you who wish to refresh your memory can visit those videos. Now coming to the decussations found in the midbrain. At the level of inferior colliculi, we find the decussation of superior cerebellar peduncle fibers where both the afferent and the efferent fibers to the cerebellum will be decussating. One of the afferent fiber bundle which will be decussating here belongs to ventral spinocerebellar tract as we had studied in our video on spinocerebellar tracts. At the level of superior colliculi, we find two decussations a dorsal tegmental decussation and a ventral tegmental decussation. Dorsal tegmental decussation fibers begin from the superior colliculi. They wind round the periaqueductal gray, cross in the dorsal tegmental decussation, project to the contralateral spinal cord as the tectospinal tracts. These tectospinal tracts will descend through the brainstem on either side of the midline just anterior to the medial longitudinal fasciculi. When they reach the spinal cord, they will be found in the ventral funiculi. Now, this tract is involved in turning the eyes and the head to the source of pain. Now coming to the ventral tegmental decussation, the fibers which will be crossing in the ventral tegmental decussation begin from the red nuclei. So these fibers cross in the ventral tegmental decussation and project to the contralateral spinal cord as the rubrospinal tracts. Now, rubrospinal tracts in the brainstem will be located more in the lateral part of the tegmentum and when, it, when they reach spinal cord, it will be located in the lateral funiculus just adjacent to the lateral corticospinal tract. Now, this fiber bundle is involved in controlling voluntary movements. The fibers in this tract will be facilitators for the flexors and inhibitors to the extensors. 
Now, remembering which fibers will decussate in dorsal tegmental decussation and which fibers will decussate in ventral tegmental decussation is very simple if you remember the relative positions of superior colliculus and the red nuclei. Superior colliculus is more dorsally placed, so the fibers starting from there will be decussating in the dorsal tegmental decussation. Red nuclei are located more ventrally, so the fibers starting from the red nuclei will be decussating in the ventral tegmental decussation. Now, after decussating at the level of superior colliculi, they form the definitive tracks. So, these tracks can be seen from the level of midbrain at the level of inferior colliculi and all the successive lower levels. So, in the picture on the left side here, we are seeing the tectospinal tracts as well as the rubrospinal tracts. Now, coming to some of the composite fibers within the midbrain, first let us begin with the central tegmental tracts. These are the tracts found in the anterolateral part of the tegmentum. Their fibers contain basically the fibers descending from the parvocellular part of the red nucleus and some of the fibers which will also begin from the periaqueductal gray. Now these fibers descend to the medulla where they project to the inferior olivary nuclear complex. Now this is an important pathway in, involved, which is involved in motor learning. We have learnt about this pathway in detail when we were studying the connections to the inferior olivary nuclear complex. In addition, the central tegmental tract may also have some of the fibers of solitariothalamic tract and some of the reticulothalamic tract fibers as the ascending group of fibers within the central tegmental tract. That's why it becomes a composite tract having more than one fiber bundle. Now coming to the next composite tract that is the dorsal longitudinal fasciculus or fasciculus of Schutz. Now this is again made up of both ascending and descending fiber bundles. The ascending fibers include solitario hypothalamic tract fibers and some of the serotonergic fibers. And the descending fibers include the descending autonomic fibers which begin from the hypothalamus and they project to the preganglionic sympathetic neurons which are located in the lateral horn of the spinal cord. So any injury to this dorsal longitudinal fasciculus will result in the features of Horner syndrome. Now coming to the third composite bundle that is the medial longitudinal fasciculus. You will remember that we have been identifying this fiber bundle throughout all the sections of the brainstem. Now this is again one more composite fiber bundle made up of predominantly myelinated fibers which includes both ascending and the descending fibers. These medial longitudinal fasciculi are located always close to the midline throughout midbrain, pons, medulla as well as in the upper segments of the spinal cord. They are located ventral to the somatic efferent nuclei. So at the level of superior colliculi, they are anterior to the oculomotor nuclei. At the level of inferior colliculi, they are anterior to the trochlear nuclei. In pons, they are anterior to the abducens nuclei. And in medulla, they are anterior to the hypoglossal nuclei. And of course, these fiber bundles are anterior to the cerebral aqueduct, fourth ventricle and central canal, depending upon at what part of the brainstem we are talking about. So now let us learn about what are the fiber bundles which will make up this medial longitudinal fasciculus. As I said earlier, it is made up of both ascending and the descending fibers. Now these fibers will be interconnecting all the four vestibular nuclei with the nuclei which will be supplying the muscles of the eye. That includes the oculomotor nuclei, edinger westphal nucleus, the trochlear nucleus and the abducens nucleus of the same side. It will also be receiving inf uh, inputs from the nucleus of lateral lemniscus, the spinal accessory nucleus and the medial longitudinal fasciculus will descend to the upper part of the spinal cord where it will be relaying in the motor neurons present in the ventral grey horn. The cranial end of the medial longitudinal fasciculus will be connecting with the rostral interstitial nucleus of the middle medial longitudinal fasciculus. Now that is the vertical gaze center. Interstitial nucleus of Cajal, it is a torsional gaze center and also with the nucleus of posterior commissure or nucleus of dark chevish which controls the reflex gaze. This medial longitudinal fasciculus not only 
connects with these three nuclei of the same site but it will also communicate with the same nuclei of the opposite site through the posterior commissure and lastly it will connect with the contralateral oculomotor nucleus especially that part of the oculomotor nucleus which will be supplying the medial rectus muscle so through, through all these interconnections the medial longitudinal fasciculus will control conjugate eye movements as well as the associated movement of the head and the neck now there is a second set of motor nuclei which include the motor nucleus of the trigeminal facial nucleus and the hypoglossal nuclei now trigeminal motor nuclei will be supplying the muscles of mastication facial nucleus will be supplying the muscles of facial expression and the hypoglossal nuclei will be supplying the muscles of the tongue now these group of muscles will also need to be coordinated during mastication and articulation so these three nuclei may also be interconnecting with each other through the medial longitudinal fasciculus or they may have an alternative path now coming to what happens if things go wrong if there is a lesion to the medial longitudinal fasciculus we get a condition called as internuclear ophthalmoplegia so let us find out what that is let us start with the frontal eye field now this is located in the posterior part of the middle frontal gyrus that is area number 6 8 and 9 this frontal eye field controls voluntary contralateral saccades that is we are seeing the left cerebral hemisphere here so the left sided frontal eye field will make you look voluntarily to the right so when i'm looking voluntarily to the right my right eye is abducted which is brought about by the lateral rectus of the right eye which is supplied by abducens nerve my left eye is adducted which is brought about by the medial rectus supplied by the oculomotor nerve so here there is simultaneous activity of the right sided lateral rectus and left sided medial rectus now this is what is brought about by the interconnection in the medial longitudinal fasciculus so let us see how that works from the frontal eye field on the left side the fibers project to right sided pontine paramedian reticular formation or otherwise known as pprf now this is the horizontal gaze center now this PPRF is located just lateral to the abducens nucleus within the pons once it receives input from the frontal eye field it will project to the abducens nucleus of the same side so from the left frontal eye field the right sided PPRF was stimulated which will stimulate the right sided abducens nucleus which will thereby make the right lateral rectus contract and make the right eye to abduct now from the interneurons starting in the uh, interneurons which are located in the abducens nucleus here the fibers will project to medial longitudinal fasciculus which will connect with the left sided oculomotor nucleus especially that part which will be supplying the medial rectus so that will simultaneously bring about the medial rectus of the left eye to work bringing about adduction of the left eye this is how we look voluntarily to the right side now this is in a normal person now things can go wrong here by either through a lesion in the frontal eye field or lesion of the abducens nerve or a lesion in the medial longitudinal fasciculus or a lesion in the left sided oculomotor nucleus in each case the patient is unable to see properly to the right side voluntarily he will be unable to see the see to the right side but so there will be slight change in the presentation so let's find out what it is in case there is lesion to the left frontal eye field both his eyes will not be able to turn to the right that is right eye fails to abduct and left eye fails to adduct not only that the right sided frontal eye field now has unopposed action so both eyes will be now deviated to the left side if there is a lesion to the right abducens nerve the right sided lateral rectus will be paralyzed so right eye is unable to abduct however the left eye can adduct 
this will of course result in diplopia whenever the patient tries to look to the right side if there is lesion in the medial longitudinal fasciculus now there is input from the frontal eye field to the PPRF from the PPRF there is input to the abducens nucleus of the right side so the right eye is able to abduct but the connection between the abducens nucleus of the right side and the left side oculomotor nucleus that is interrupted at the medial longitudinal fasciculus so left eye fails to adduct now this is what we call as internuclear ophthalmoplegia however there is nothing wrong in the left sided oculomotor nucleus or in the left oculomotor nerve so patient can converge his eyes that is he can adduct his eye otherwise he cannot adduct it only when he is asked to look to the opposite side now coming to the lesion for the left oculomotor nucleus or to the left oculomotor nerve in this case also the right eye can abduct and left eye fails to adduct but here the lesion is to the nucleus itself so even convergence will not be possible so when we say internuclear ophthalmoplegia we mean lesion to the medial longitudinal fasciculus there if there is lesion to the right sided medial longitudinal fasciculus the right eye will be able to abduct but left eye fails to adduct now that is the condition which we call as internuclear ophthalmoplegia thank you very much hope you enjoyed this video you can visit this site for other videos in on neuroanatomy thank you